Welcome to Genuine Life Recovery. We're here to help you and your loved ones overcome addictions and other addiction-related mental health challenges. In this show, we dive into the physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual aspects of addiction, mental health, recovery, family dynamics, codependency, and more. You can listen on your favorite app or at jodystevens.org. Genuine Life Recovery is made possible by great friends like Joshua's Heart in memory of Joshua Brent Moore, bringing hope, love, and awareness to those afflicted by addiction online at joshesheart.org and Jody Stevens Productions for commercial voiceover, narration, production, MC, and public speaking online at jodystevens.org. Hey friends, welcome back to Genuine Life Recovery. This is episode 139. (laughs) I can hardly believe it. I've been going for a couple years, so I'm super excited that you could join me. And today I want to dive into uh, the criteria to determine the treatment plan and the type of treatment for somebody entering into uh, addiction recovery. And it's super important. So, you know, you go and you get a good assessment and then there's some criteria that and that's what we're going to focus on that's going to determine the areas um, that are going to need the most work the type of treatment program like do you need to go into medical detox inpatient outpatient um, stuff like that um y- you know uh, one of the things that they always say in treatment is it works if you work it and that is totally true if you work any program Uh, with your heart and soul, it is going to work. However, the idea of this criteria is to make it work better, right? If, if, If you're going into a treatment plan and it's designed for you, you're going to have an easier time with recovery as opposed to going into recovery center where people are dealing with things that maybe you're not dealing with. Okay, so, and and then also it's just important, let, let's say you're a parent trying to get your kid into a treatment center. These are really good things to know because most people don't know this. And so they'll head into a treatment center without really knowing what to expect. And so they'll just take at face value whatever's being told to them. So you kind of have to be your own advocate, right? Just like in... um in healthcare and stuff like that, because there's really good treatment centers. There's okay treatment centers. There's bad, there's really bad, just like anything. So um, today we're going to look at what's called the uh, ASAM criteria. And there are six of these. I'm going to add a seventh spiritual dimension, which science doesn't use and treatment doesn't use and psychology in general doesn't use, but I would just like to add that and create a spiritual perspective for these these six criteria. But one of the things that's going to happen initially is you're going to go into a treatment program and there's going to be an initial assessment or interview. And those typically are very long. I've done them before. They can be as long as an hour, two hours, depending on the substance used, substances used, because you have to do a, go through the 11 criteria for addiction or substance use disorder. And you have to do that for each substance used. And often when people come into treatment, they're using three or more substances. So for me, when I got sober, my main vice was alcohol. (laughs) They would have said, yes, you have an alcohol use disorder. Next, they would have assessed me for marijuana because I smoked a lot of weed. However, I could do without weed. uh, So I may not qualify for a substance use or a marijuana use disorder, but they would still have to check that anyway. I also smoke cigarettes. Now we have nicotine use disorder. So you see how this can take a while, but it's really important because oftentimes people will will um, show up with, with multiple addictions, maybe alcohol and opiates or alcohol and, and benzos or, you know, what, what I would pop sometimes when I was drinking, like, you know, Xanax or something like that. So, so what's going to happen is this interview is going to be about a lot of stuff. It's going to be about um, the types of drugs use, the pattern of use, the date of last use, and that's going to go through every type of drug. Then it's going to determine um, 
history of substance use disorder in your life, history of substance use disorder in your family's life. Um, it's going to look at uh, mental health, the whether or not you've been diagnosed with a mental health challenge. And it's going to look at all aspects like suicide and um, schizophrenia type uh, disorders. It's going to look at anxiety. It's going to look at depression. There's always going to be a suicide watch, um, you know, quick test for that because obviously that's, you know, that's huge. That's super important. Um, so all of this will happen. They'll look for mental health issues within your family, uh, family history of that. They're going to look at your living situation, what it's like, level of education, level of last job, whether or not you have kids. Um, all of these things are going to play a huge role in figuring out how to best treat you. So it's not a conspiracy or anything like that. It's just it's just like if you go in for therapy, anybody that's ever had therapy, they, they're going to want to know all this stuff because they want to best help you. And life is different for everybody and everybody. So all these things I'm talking about are really what's called situational or world like risk factors. You know, let's say you come in and your home life is very unstable. That's a risk factor. They're going to want to know about trauma, past trauma. That's going to be a risk factor. Uh, again, if you're if you're homeless, that's going to be a risk factor. Part of your treatment is going to be involved in getting uh, an individual into stabilized housing or things like that. If there's a strong mental health thing, like maybe you were diagnosed bipolar or things like that, there's going to be, uh, it's going to be recommended that you have um, a certain amount of therapy, maybe different types of um, medications to go along with the treatment. Okay. So all that stuff's going to happen. And as um, someone entering into treatment, you should know all that because you want that to happen because you want the treatment to be successful for you. If you're going to go into a program, if you're going to pay for a program, if you're going to commit to a program, right, you want it to work. You want it to be the best program that it can be. So uh, once all of this stuff is gathered, this, this initial intake, what all of this does is then it helps to determine, based on these criteria, uh, the best type of treatment for you. Okay, and so, so basically, we we gather this information and then you get scored on what's called the ASAM criteria. I know it's I'm trying not to make it you know uh, scientific, but basically, ASAM stands for American Society of Medicine, and so they created this criteria. Uh, people that have been in the treatment, uh, that have been counselors and stuff for a long time, there's kind of mixed feelings about it. You know, like, oh gosh, I can't believe we all have to do this. <laughs> you know, um, I think it's pretty good. Uh, really what it's trying to do is just standardize it so that everybody's on the same page and different clinicians aren't just doing their own thing. Um, and that doesn't mean that there aren't <clears throat> amazing clinicians that don't necessarily use this, right? Uh, it's just that they standardize this and most people use it. And in general, it's it's really good. Uh, it's really helpful. So ASAM criteria deals with six areas, um, six dimensions that will determine the level of care that you're going to need, whether it's inpatient, outpatient, uh, stuff like that. Okay. So uh, again, I've added a seventh, which is a spiritual dimension. <laughs> so that's just my own, <laughs> which, which, um, you know, I mean, our spirituality is, is important. It's, you know, in addiction and recovery, a person's spirituality is, is going to be a huge part of their treatment. If so, like I'm a Christian and I believe in eternal life. I believe that I believe in science, but I also believe that this isn't the end of the story, that God is orchestrating my life in the recovery process, that he has a plan for me. So that is going to be huge in your treatment plan. Sadly, most, a lot of, um, Places don't really address this. Now, they will if you ask them to. Okay, they will if you ask them to. Uh, and it, obviously, if it's, a, if it's a Christian treatment center, they definitely will. But a lot of times, you know, when I was getting my MS and addiction counseling, you know, they would talk about spirituality. 
uh, never really anything Christian. It was generally, um, you know, different religions, Native American stuff like that, which is great, but God forbid, God forbid we talk about Jesus or Christianity. So that really was never in there. And I've talked to, like one time I was, I was, um, we were doing an intake with someone and she was talking about praying and, and I was just getting my like internship or, or, um, you know, my practicum. And so, but, but, but the therapist was, was, she didn't know what to do. She didn't know how to handle that. And, and so I kind of took over for a few minutes because, you know, I'm a Christian, so I know how to pray with people and talk about their faith. And after the person left, she's like, I don't, I don't know how to, to deal with that. And, and we're not supposed to, I mean, that's what people think. I'm like, oh no, you can, you can go there. It's just that as a believer, you know, we have to, again, be proactive and bring that up. Hey, you know, this belief, you know, I'm a Christian, this is very important to me. Can we please incorporate this into my treatment plan? Okay. So, um, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> so, so what exactly is this ASAM criteria? Uh, why does it, and why does it matter? So it is again, six dimensions and they evaluate aspects of your life and your health. In addition to, you know, after that, that initial assessment, and, and it's going to help us or clinicians or drug and alcohol counselors provide more of a, a, a personalized care plan because it's going to be tied into what you need. There are some things that you're going to need that other people don't need. So what it is, is it's looking at every aspect of your well-being. For instance, I had an anxiety disorder. I've mentioned this many times. I had panic attacks and things like that. So in that psychological section, I ended up going to AA, so I didn't do traditional treatment. Now, if I would have, they would have assessed me on that anxiety. When did you have panic attacks? You know, when did they start? Uh, you know, things like that. So that would be a huge trigger. So the anxiety thing would would be looked at, right? So with that, let's talk about the dimensions. So the six dimensions of care in the ASAM, Number one is acute intoxication and withdrawal potential. So this is focusing on your level of intoxication. What is your risk for withdrawal? Withdrawal can be super dangerous. Alcohol withdrawal can kill you. Benzo withdrawal can kill you. Um, opiate withdrawal is just really scary. People continue to use opiates because they're so afraid of the withdrawal of the detox. Now, when I was detoxing from alcohol, I was able to do it fine on my own. I had some shakes a little bit, but that was about it. Now, my brother, on the other hand, who passed from his addiction in 2015, would have massive grand mal seizures that could have killed him. In fact, one time he had this seizure on my floor when I was about to take him to a treatment center. I didn't even know what was going on. I called the paramedics. I mean, I had no idea. I had no idea that alcohol withdrawal caused this. I mean, I was like 25. Like, what did I know, you know? Um, and I was still drinking at the time and he was drinking and, you know, it was so it was really, really, really freaking scary. So if you think that a severe alcoholic can just quit, think again, it doesn't work that way. You actually have to give them alcohol so they don't have seizures and stuff like that. So this whole thing uh, is really important because if you need detox, then you need detox. Because if you don't have detox, it's very dangerous. I mean, think about, you know, just the way the brain works. If you're, if you're ingesting a medication or a substance in high quantities for long periods of time, and that, that substance is making all this dopamine and GABA and all these things in your brain. And then suddenly you stop, you know, you can seizure out and things like that. So, um, and, and your body can have other withdrawal symptoms, uh, and things like that. So what that's going to focus on then is, is that's that dimension and you will be rated on that dimension. So it's going to look back at, okay, they're drinking every day. How much are they drinking? 
Uh, a fifth of vodka every day. Safe to say, if you're drinking a fifth of vodka every day, you are going to need medical detox. You you don't just, you know what I mean? So, but but anyway, I, I don't mean to make that funny because it's really not. But I mean, I'm just saying that's going to be a territory where you are going to need detox. Now, you may be just like me, where you're an alcoholic, but you don't drink every night. But when you do, you get totally drunk. And maybe you're drinking wine a lot or beer. You're not always drinking hard liquor. You can probably detox on your own. Okay, so that's dimension one is rating you on how severe the detox is. And I'll get into um, what they would recommend based on that coming up. So again, this is this is crucial for a person's safety because of the dangers and life-threatening symptoms that come uh, with with withdrawals. <laughs> and so clinicians use it, drug and alcohol counselors are going to use this, even like a, a you know, like I do recovery coaching. Um, you know, I don't have a license, I just do coaching, but I have an MS in addiction counseling. So I would use some of this, not so much in a clinical sense, but just get to get the, the idea to get to know you because if I was going to coach you in recovery and found out that you were doing heroin every day or drinking a fifth of vodka, I would be recommending that you get into an inpatient and get um, detox before I would be able to help you because until that, um, until you're, you're detox, there's no way you're going to be able to, to quit. Okay. Um, and so obviously, you know, this dimension is huge because it's going to minimize health risks and it's also going to ensure that, that you are getting th the proper level of care. So let's say you're not having withdrawal symptoms and they tell you to go into a hospital, right? And so, so you're, you're, you're in a hospital with people that are doing this intensive inpatient and yet you don't even have withdrawal symptoms. See, that's not going to be a good fit, right? And so that's why uh, this is important. So uh, dimension two is biomedical. So this is just medical things. Um, so your physical health, that's one of the things that we're going to want to know about during an initial assessment to make sure that your treatment is holistic. <laughs> that word always bugs me. I don't know why, but it makes sense, holistic. Um, so because a lot of times addiction is going to coexist with other medical conditions. Addiction can cause those medical conditions. Those medical conditions could be pre-existing. Sometimes a medical condition can cause us to want to drink or use opiates. A lot of people coming into opiate treatment started with horrible pain. They had a really bad accident on the job. They're back. You know, the, remember the whole dope sick and the whole... Um, opiate crisis and Purdue Pharma and all that stuff. That's, you know, that, that that's kind of how that started with pain. People had chronic pain. So that's going to be considered in your treatment program. I mean, if you have chronic pain, how are we going to address the pain and also address the addiction? Okay. So that's, that's a tough one. Um, but again, that's, that's, uh, really important. Um, so that's considered so like there's co-occurring mental health issues which is which is on the next one and and then there's co-occurring um uh physical um health issues and so uh that's what that's looking at maybe there's um diseases or chronic illnesses uh needle users and stuff there could be aids and things like that so so looking at you know, making sure, right, that when you are in treatment, that those things are considered, that you're getting the right treatment, that you're getting the right therapy, that you're getting the right medication for for your issue uh, or your um, your health uh, health issue. So this is huge <clears throat> alongside addiction treatment again, so that you have uh, you have a better chance of recovery if those health issues are considered. Okay. So, so we did, um, dimension one was withdrawal potential. Dimension two is medical conditions. Uh, dimension three is the psychological, right? Emotional, behavioral, cognitive, things like that. And that's going to be looking at, um, mental health because I've never known anyone 
with an addiction that didn't have a co-occurring mental health issue. I never have. Um, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. It's just very common that there is a history of trauma, that there's a history of abuse, that there's a history of maybe homelessness within the family, that there's codependent relating patterns within the family, that there's different diagnosis like bipolar is a very common one. Um, so things like that. So obviously there's a complex interplay generally between addiction and recovery and mental health. And that has to be taken into consideration and properly managed in the past. It wasn't. And so um, people struggled to find success in recovery because their mental health issues, PTSD, war trauma, those things were not being addressed. So, so um, again, therapists addiction counselors will use this to uh, to rate you on you know depression or anxiety any type of cognitive thing and so again that's going to continue to help with your treatment plan because maybe you need serious uh, inpatient detox right level one and then it's determined that you have really bad depression and you were once diagnosed um, bipolar so that's gonna be uh, recommended that you see a counselor a, a mental health therapist in addition to an addiction counselor that's going to treat that depression that bipolar okay so does that make sense um so again psychologists therapist counselors are going to use this to provide again that that um that overall holistic you know looking at the whole picture your whole person to determine the type of treatment dimension 4 is a big one this is called readiness to change D does the individual want to change so this one um is a big deal because a lot of people come into recovery because the wife made them, the parents made them, you know, things like that. The husband made them and maybe they just, they're there, but you can tell by their language that they don't really want to be there or that they don't really want to change. So that needs to be taken into consideration because there are techniques such as motivational interviewing, which is really cool, and things like that that can help you move towards change, like that can help with your motivation. Because, I mean, let's face it, you're in recovery, you know, your life's falling apart, you're happier drunk, <laughs> and now you're in this treatment program, and it's not really fun. And so, you, you know, most people don't really initially want to be there. Even if they know they have to be there, nobody's like, oh, it's just, you know, I just love being in treatment. And so there, there are ways to, um, to address people's um, willingness to change, to get them closer to that change, to look at like discrepancies in their life. Like a lot of people will say, well, I, you know, I'm in control and, you know, addiction doesn't really affect my life, except and then you hone in on the accept and what is the exception and then you help them see that exception which is my wife doesn't talk to me when i'm drunk or you know my liver is really bad <laughs> i have control and i'm fine but my liver is really bad right so you want to kind of move them towards seeing those things and recognizing kind of the discrepancies in their speech and things like that and what they're saying and so that they can come to their own conclusion and and move toward change okay so um so readiness to change dimension four is really just gauging someone's motivation to engage in treatment how motivated are they to make those life changes so again this is crucial for tailoring specific interventions right that are going to move you that are going to move you toward change because obviously you're in this program and it's important to everybody involved that you are successful so that is a dimension for readiness to change dimension um, five is uh, relapse continued use or continued problem potential so again, we, this is in looking at the potential for relapse. So in the initial assessment is really 
how many times have you been in recovery? How often do you have uh, relapses, things like that? This would indicate that we really need to focus on strategies and interventions and things like that. Um, you know, I tried to quit several times on my own and it just didn't take, it didn't work. I kept going back and I kept, I kept using again or, you know, drinking again. However, once I ended up getting help, I didn't have any relapses. A lot of people, you know, I'll take my brother, for example, you know, before he passed, he'd probably been into a hundred treatment centers. And so very high potential for relapse. And a high potential for relapse means probably a higher level of care, maybe inpatient treatment and and some heavier therapy and psychotherapy or, or, or cognitive behavioral type stuff so that you can identify triggers, that you can identify high risk situations. Some people have really bad uh, coping strategies. If there was trauma or something and life was very chaotic when you were young, there was probably these really ineffective ways that you learned to cope or, or just didn't cope. And so one of the ways you learn to cope was through drugs and alcohol. So if that's your only coping skill, it's going to be nearly impossible for you to stay sober until you can develop those new coping skills. So again, this is looking at dimension five. What's, um, what is your potential for relapse? How do we develop intervention strategies? How do we reduce those relapse risks? Um, what are the triggers that we need to move you away from? So again, this is going to help manage that relapse potential um, and help you support uh, long-term recovery. Okay. So some people are going to be more prone to relapse than others. So how you score on that dimension, and these are scored like one through four. So how you score on that dimension, again, is going to determine the type of treatment for you. It should. <laughs> Again, it doesn't always, depending on the treatment program, which is why this stuff is, is good to know. Um, and then finally, dimension six is your living environment. This is huge. This looks at your living situation, the social supports that can either hinder or harm your recovery process. Are you living with another alcoholic? Are you living in a house where everybody's using drugs? Are you sleeping at a park where there's heroin? Are you in a, a homeless camp? Are you in a, um, what are they, uh, you know, a, um, a shelter where drugs, you know, a lot of times these shelters, drugs are just coming in and out. So that's going to be um, a big deal. And then it's also going to look at what supports do you have? Maybe you're living with your grandma who doesn't allow any drugs in the house. That's going to be a good support, things like that. So, so again, um, if you're, if you're homeless, this is a huge factor because part of your treatment program is going to look at housing. Uh, it's going to look at family dynamics. If there's a lot of dysfunction in the family, you may, may need to kind of move away from that environment for a while because it can be very triggering, right? <laughs> Family's always the best at triggering you, right? You know, um, and and so if, you're, if your living environment is really bad, it's going to be how do we, you know, if we can't get you out of it, how do we get you into healthy relationships, into really good 12-step programs, into therapy to help with that until you can get out of um, that situation. So this is important for, you know, social workers and, and, and case managers. And, you know, because if, if I'm a, a clinician, a, a counselor, I'm going to be working with case managers, social workers, and things like that to, to help you. Uh, this, this also can include an arrest record and things like that. And that's going to be um, tied into this as well to help you with those areas uh, of your life because that's going to, again, help you for, um, to build a strong long-term foundation of sobriety. So those are the six dimensions. Um, the seventh one I'd like to mention is spiritual. I'm going to do that um, after we look at, um, so based on these dimensions, you, an individual would be rated one, which is mild, moderate, which is two, substantial, which is three, and four, which is severe. 
Okay. So combining all this, it is going to determine the type of intervention or treatment. So level one is 0 0.5. This is early intervention. I could have used this in college when I got arrested for a DUI. Um, so level one would be, obviously you don't need detox. You're kind of showing signs of problem use, problem drinking. And it would be good for you to um, do some classes and, and, and uh, do some intervention work before you develop a substance use disorder. And this is huge for young people, college kids and stuff like that. Um, usually it doesn't happen, unfortunately, but, but that intervention um, is, is a really big deal because without it, um, you know, you're going to do what I did. You're going to progress to more and more use and then you're going to become an alcoholic or a drug addict. Because when we're, when we're young, you know, our brain hasn't even developed enough. We're not, we're typically not, uh, have, we typically don't have a substance use disorder when we're 15. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but usually it's not. The brain's not even there yet. That's why you want to do intervention before you, you kind of cross that line. Anyway, I won't go into all these, but, but then level one is going to be outpatient treatment. So this is where, um, it's, it's around nine hours a week of classes of, um, you know, AA, um, AA uh, groups and things like that, right? So, so you want like nine hours or so a week. Then there's level 2.1. This is a more intensive outpatient. So um, they would recommend 20 hours of treatment a week, some medical care within the first um, 72 hours. Level 2.5, that's partial hospitalization along with 20 hours a week. Level 3.1, low intensity residential treatment, uh, group homes, things like that. And they're going to look at relapse management and things like that. There's level 3.3. This is high intensity. So there's low intensity and high intensity. Um, and this is often people with brain injuries, older individuals and stuff like that, people with disabilities. Okay, there's a level 3.5 clinically managed <clears throat> residential. So this is residential, but also, um, also helping with psychological issues and detox and stuff like that. Level 3.7, medically managed, high intensity inpatient treatment. This is full-blown inpatient treatment where you're doing 24-hour setting, you're in there, um, and you, you're constantly uh, in a recovery environment for a period of time. Then there's level four, which is really bad, and that's, um, you know, 24-hour nursing, physician care. Uh, you know, you're, you're basically being monitored because you know, maybe you're in severe withdrawal, there's problems with your liver, there's problems with your kidneys, things like that. Um, so, you know, before like that, that would have been the kind of treatment that would have been beneficial to my brother. So, so again, you know, this stuff can be helpful because, you know, it makes sense if you're, if you're 16 and you're not really an alcoholic, you don't want to be, you know, and you're all of a sudden you're, you're thrown into this inpatient thing. It's, it might be, you know, it might not be that helpful for you. So you want, you want to be treated, um, you know, get treatment that's going to be right for you. So the other dimension that I would like to look at is just the spiritual dimension, because again, I think that's really important. You're not going to find this on anything clinical usually, unless it's a, you know, if it's obviously, if it's a Christian recovery program, they're going to address, you know, some of these things, but you know, the Bible tells us that we are uh, fighting a spiritual battle, that there are spiritual things going on. And so that's important to know. The Bible also tells us about the world the flesh and the devil. When we look at Jesus and how he, how he was tempted, right? He was tempted with the flesh. Food was how Satan tempted him. We're tempted with drugs. We're tempted with alcohol. So 
again, we have to look at that in, in a spiritual sense as well. He was tempted with the world, right? We, we get caught into these addictions of different things because of all the things we want, right? He's, oh, if you worship me, I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. And that can be a huge trap that can lead to addiction, right? So we have the world, the flesh, and the devil. The other thing is many people may come into recovery having been uh, have having a severe history of the occult or witchcraft so i won't totally get too far into this because i don't want to freak people out not everyone can accept this but it is very true in the cases of severe oppression um or even um demonic type possessions um there has always been the occult there has always been a portal of the occult which needs to be addressed. I think that it needs to be addressed because that um, the enemy is always going to come at you until you con confess that, work through that, and close that door. You know, I had to do that. I got sober uh, from alcohol. I wasn't too heavy into the occult, but I was about to get into Wicca and witchcraft and things like that. And I had some weird stuff going on. You know, like one time I was, I was lucid dreaming. I won't go into all of what that is, but I was doing that. I was like levitated. I don't know if it was real or a dream. It was very demonic. It was like this exorcist thing. And, you know, I had to pray through that. It wasn't intense. Like I, it wasn't like, you know, I had to have deliverance, but it was, um, some stuff that had to be, that had to be worked out. Now, imagine if I had been, uh, way into the occult. There would have been some other issues and a lot of that occult stuff can lead to addiction. So uh, again, I think that the spiritual piece needs to, to be addressed and, and, and not just the dark side, but, but the beauty, the beautiful side of, 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 of God and how he transcends all of this, how he can come into our life and into our spirit and possess us with the Holy spirit, help us to see, um, why we need help. You know, that was huge for me that most people in recovery have what they call like a spiritual awakening where all of a sudden you see things clearly, you see things for what they are. You know, for me, it was the Lord really showing me that I had to clean up my life, you know, um, like that I was the problem, <laughs> you know, that I needed to fix certain things, but that, but that he would be there with me. So anyway, that's, that's, that's my seventh dimension dimension. <laughs> ASAM one through six plus seven. Um, so anyway, um, hopefully this was helpful to you. It's called the ASAM criteria. Uh, it's important because it's just part of the good screening. I, I, I think it's I think it's an important thing. It's a personalized approach. And that personalized approach is really going to just maximize your chances of being successful um, in your recovery. Because again, uh, your genetics are taken into consideration, your mental health, your living environment, your physical condition and your psychological condition. Those are all things that need to be addressed because those are all things that can contribute to having an addiction or, or a substance use disorder. All right, so hope this was useful to you. If it was, please share it uh, also with anyone else that you know that could use it uh, and would benefit from this. And hopefully it's helpful to you. If you're heading into recovery, you'll know what to look for. You can know some of the questions to ask. If you have a um, son or daughter entering in recovery or a spouse, again, you can know some of these criteria and some of the, the uh, questions to ask. So friends, Thank you so much for listening to this episode, episode uh, 100 and what did I say? 139, the seven keys to personalized addiction treatment. So uh, please share this. It plays on your favorite app. Feel free to leave a review and you can also catch this episode and the other 138 episodes uh, on my website at jodystevens.org, J-O-D-I-E-S-T-E-V-E-N-S, jodystevens.org, or like I said, on your favorite app. So God bless you, and thanks for listening and watching.
Thank you so much, friends, for listening to Genuine Life Recovery, playing on your favorite app or on my website at jodystevens.org. It's J-O-D-I-E-S-T-E-V-E-N-S, jodystevens.org. There you can check out my podcast, blog, recovery coaching info, speaking, and more. Check it out.